This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text today comes from the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, chapter 25 and verse 40, reading from the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. I'm speaking today from the subject simply, see, feel, trust. See, feel, trust. This is God speaking to his servant Moses. And God has plans for the tabernacle. You know, God is an original. He's the creator, Elohim, creator God. Uh, it's like he's his own architect. He's the master architect of the universe. He's his own interior designer. So he's giving Moses uh, the particulars about everything that is to be done in the tabernacle. And he says, Moses, listen, I showed you the pattern in the mountain. And I want you to make sure that you deliver it just like I'm ordering it. Listen, when you're paying for something and you're getting something custom, it ought to be just the way that you're ordering it. Doesn't it bother you? Wouldn't it be offensive to you if you go to a restaurant and you order your steak medium rare and they bring it well done because the chef says, I like mine well done? Well, when you're the chef, you, you don't cook it the way you like it. You cook it the way that the people who are paying for it have ordered it and deliver it that way. This is where God is with Moses. He says, Moses, I know you're from Egypt, and I know you've been trained in all of the arts of Egypt, but this is my house I'm talking about. You can build your house how you want to build your house, but this is my house. And listen, excellence is always found in the details. So God is a God of specificity and details. And that's why whenever you follow God's order to the T, to the letter, it is so beautiful and people are wowed by the attention to detail. God told him exactly how to make the curtains, how many loops to put, what material to make it out of, make this out of gold, make this out of silver. I'm at the table of showbread. Every article of everything that was in the tabernacle, God gave Moses clear, specific instruction so that you could not misunderstand it. And he simply said to Moses, not trying to insult his attention, but he says, listen, Moses, make this exactly according to the way I showed you, according to the pattern that I showed you in the mountain. Now, God showed him something in the mountain. The mountain here is a type of the Spirit of God. And so my question to you is, what do you see? What do you see? What has God shown you in the mountain? Have you ever been to the mountain where you get lifted up out of the morass of mediocrity and God shows you something on another level? You have to see there before you go there. Wherever it is, you got to see there before you go there. I mean, if you, if you, if you are big boned and you're trying to lose weight, uh, get a picture of yourself when you were the size that you really enjoyed. Put a picture of where you're going. Put a picture of that size up there for you, whatever that is for you. Put a picture of it. See it. See it. Get the picture in your mind's eye. Get, get a picture in, in, in your heart. It's, it's like building your own vision board. you got to be able to see something. 
God showed Moses the architectural designs and all of the interior plans of everything that he wanted to go, every article that was to go, every piece of furniture. God told him what type of wood it should be made of and overlay this with gold. He told him the kind of fabric to use for the curtains. God gave Moses very specific instruction. He showed him something. He saw something. If you don't see anything, you can't do it. You got to see it before you do it. And here God is just drawing Moses in. He takes him into a realm of the spirit and shows him something on the mountain and then sends him back to the valley and said, go down there and build it. I'm going to show it to you up here. Go down and build it here. Your mountaintop experience might be in your bed in a dream. It may be in a vision. It may be in an imagination of your heart that God put a desire on the inside of you, but you have to see it. You have to see the stuff being acted out. And the greater detail in which you see a dream or a vision, the greater the probability of it coming into manifestation. So be very specific. Don't just say, you know, I saw myself at the altar, you know, uh, marrying somebody and it was a silhouette. <laughs> you need to be able to see with specificity. How tall was he? How tall was she? If you don't get it with specificity, you won't recognize it when it comes. Now, here's the thing. God will show you something uh, that is beautiful and glorious and he'll show it to you in the spirit, but then he sends you back to the mountain and you begin with it in seed form. That's the way God operates. He'll show you a beautiful, magnificent uh, vision of something and then he brings it back in a seed form. Here's what happens. You pray and ask God for bread and God sends you a seed so you can sow the seed and grow the wheat and then take the wheat and then from the wheat you make the flour and from the flour then you bake the bread. When you pray for bread, God sends you with seed. His answer is seed. And there are so many times that people have prayed to God and asked God for something and they didn't recognize the answer because the answer came in seed form. You pray, God, I would love to have a mighty oak tree in my front yard. And God answers your prayer by having a squirrel drop an acorn on your porch. <laughs> the oak tree is locked in the acorn. And the only reason that you don't recognize the oak tree is because it was disguised in seed form. How many times have we missed what God was showing us because it was locked or disguised in seed form? And so what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? And, and, and listen, if you really want to be prophetic about it, what do you seed? Because you have to sow for where you're going. You have to sow for where you're going. What do you see? What do you see? Here's the thing I want you to understand that your vision is limited to your heart. Your vision is limited to your heart. Sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. Vision is a function of the heart. That's why the scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, guard your heart above all else. King James Version says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the issues of your life. It determines the course of your life. The real vision has to be in your heart. God puts vision in your heart, not your head. It's not just what you see, it's what you imagine as a gift from God in your heart. And God puts vision in your heart. And so he says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Vision is a function of your heart. It's a function of your heart. And God has more for you than you could ever imagine for yourself. If you ever notice in the word of the Lord in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, notice this. This is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen. No ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. God has something for you that's out of this world. God's desire for you is bigger than what you desire for yourself. Listen, he says no I. Now notice he says no I and not eyes. Most of us have two eyes. Uh, no ear. Most of us have two ears. No mind has imagined. You know why he's talking about eye singular? Because this is the eye that's in your heart. There's only one eye there. No, eye has not seen. That's the eye of, in your heart. 
You, you, remember, vision is a function of the heart. He's talking about your heart eye. He's talking about the ear that's inside your heart. Have you ever noticed H-E-A-R-T? Your real ear is located in your heart. So no eye has seen, no ear has imagined, no mind has imagined, no ears heard, no, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But if you go in the realm of the spirit, God will show it to you. God will show it to you. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? I'm just telling you, God will show you things beyond what you have the power to imagine. Uh, St. John chapter 16, verse 13. This was a verse that the Holy Ghost brought to me when I was looking for a wife. St. John chapter 16, verse 13. Notice this. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, notice this. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will disclose to you what is to come. God will disclose to you what is to come. If you can ever get into that mountain of God, which is a type of the realm of the spirit, you get in the spirit, God already knows it. He's omniscient. Whatever it is that you're trying to figure out, God already knows. Whatever you're trying to figure out, God already knows. And if you get in the spirit and sit at his feet and open your heart, you'll be able to hear what God has for you. He will disclose it to you. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. If I were you, I would write that down and meditate on that. St. John chapter 16, verse 13. St. John chapter 16, verse 13. I would meditate on that. Ha has it ever dawned on you? Why Joseph in the Bible, you know his, you know Joseph, the son of Jacob or Israel. Ha, has it ever dawned on you why Joseph was never overwhelmed and overcome by discouragement and depression because of all of the, the bad stuff that happened to him? Now let me say this to you. How many of you know about the story of Joseph with the coat of many colors? He was the favorite child. But listen, you can have God's favor on your life and still go through hell. Joseph was favored, but there he was then betrayed by his own brothers who plotted to kill him. And if it were not for the oldest brother, Reuben, that said, hey, this is our flesh and blood. We, 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 we shouldn't kill him. Let's sell him and at least make something off of him. And then they sold him into slavery and he's favored. I wonder, you know, now I would have some real serious issues of discouragement and doubt and uh, depression it's coming in on me if, if I know that my own brothers are plotting to kill me. And then, you know, they said, well, let's, let's give him the degree down from here. We won't kill him. We'll sell him into slavery. Uh, can you imagine what that feels like to have your blood brothers plot to kill you and then to settle on selling you into slavery, but he never became overwhelmed through discouragement as a process of this? Can you imagine what that feels like? And, and then he, he winds up in slavery, sent down to Egypt, and winds up serving in Potiphar's house. And remember when Potiphar was out of town, his wife said, oh my goodness, he's a, that's a nice looking young man there. My husband is out of town. Hey, hey, excuse me, could you come and help me uh, <laughs> lift these heavy boxes just in here in my bedroom? <laughs> and he has too much integrity he says listen number one I fear God and I respect your husband for whom I work he says I, I, I can't do that and, and, and he, he left his, his clothes in her hands and ran out of the room and she was offended that she was rejected and she lied on him and her husband came back and believed her lie and put him in prison now, he's got God's favor on him. This is the same boy, but the coat of many colors is favored. Who was plotted, murder was plotted by his own blood brothers. Then he was sold into slavery. Then he was lied on and found himself in prison. How do you keep from feeling salty under these conditions? And yet you, somebody asks you how you're doing, I'm blessed and highly favored. Really? Can you imagine how Joseph felt at this time? May I suggest to you that the only reason that Joseph did not become discouraged and overwhelmed 
and bitter against God and resentful toward him when things were not working out according to the vision that he had seen. Remember, the only reason that his brothers plotted to kill him is because he had a dream that he saw in the spirit. And they were jealous of him because he saw in the spirit that his mama and daddy and all of his brothers were going to bow down to him, that he was going to be in an exalted position. And he told them and they didn't like what they heard and they plotted to kill him because of what he saw in his heart. And the only reason that he was not overwhelmed by the circumstances of his life is because though God showed him in the spirit that he was going to be ruling and that the folks were going to bow down to him, God never showed him that his brothers would betray him. God never showed him that he would be put in a pit. God never showed him that he would be sold into slavery. God never showed him that a woman would lie on him and that he would wind up in prison. God never showed him that. He couldn't be discouraged in a situation like that because God never included those details in the vision. And he knew by the Spirit it cannot end here. It cannot end like this. God didn't show me this like this. No! I'm going to what I saw in the spirit. Make it according to the pattern that I showed you in the mountain. He had had a dream. He was guided by a dream. And God never told him the trouble that he was going to have. There are some details that God will hide from us, I believe, for our own protection. Because if God showed you everything that you were going to have to go through before you leave, that people are going to treat you this way, that you're going to deal with sickness, that you're going to deal with betrayal, that you're going to get a tax liability bill for something. If God showed you everything that you were going to deal with in this life, you would say, Lord, excuse me, but find somebody else. I think God hid it from him for Joseph's own protection. But he couldn't stop in discouragement at any of those low places in his life because they were not a part of the vision. God will intentionally leave out certain pertinent details of the journey because if he told you about the snakes and the scorpions and the pit bulls that you're going to run into on the journey, you would say, Lord, find somebody else to take this journey. It's amazing. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Remember here, God took Moses to a high place, a place in the spirit to give him God's perspective. God took him up on the mountain to give him a place in the spirit to give Moses God's perspective, just to give him God's perspective. Remember this, here's the principle. Where you sit determines what you see and how you think. Where you sit determines what you see and how you Think where you sit determines what you see and how you think. God showed him something in the realm of the spirit. So when you see something or someone that's on a higher level than where you are, please don't be intimidated by that. Be motivated by it. If somebody's doing something bigger, better than what you're doing, don't be intimidated by that. Be motivated by it. Tell the Lord, you know what, Lord, you're not a respecter of person. And Lord, I want what's for me. Don't, don't, don't get into the comparison game. Listen, I've told people for years. I, I remember the first time I went down to South America to minister. I told them, I said, yo tengo tres reglas. I have three rules. No compites, no compares, y no te quejas. Don't compete, don't compare, and don't complain. Don't compare yourself because your destiny is different. Don't measure your success by somebody else and where they are and that you all are the same age and you are classmates and they are so much farther along than you are. Don't, don't, don't get into that because what God showed you is different than what he showed them. You, want, you, you really don't want anything but what God has for you. I want you to look back again here at Exodus chapter 25 verse 40. Notice this. Be sure. God, God is, he's, he's very exact about this. God means business here. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I've shown you here on the mountain. You know, the golden rule is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But the platinum rule is do unto others the way they want to treat others the way they want to be treated. Does it not offend you if somebody gives you a gift that they like, but you don't care for it? (laughs) That's just as silly as going fishing And because you like Krispy Kreme donuts, you fish with Krispy Kreme donuts, but you have to fish with what the fish eat, the kind of bait that they eat. 
not what you like to eat. So understand here, he says, be sure that you make everything according to the pattern. Say pattern. Make it according to the pattern that I've shown you here on the mountain. I want you to notice the word pattern, pattern, because here's the deal. It takes time to observe and see patterns. It takes time to observe and see patterns. It is not, you know, you can meet somebody on a good day. You know, crazy people have good days too. You got to be around long enough. You got to date somebody long enough to go through the seasons. Anybody know what I'm talking about? To be able to see the patterns. Listen to me very carefully. Don't believe their words. Trust the patterns. The patterns will teach you a wisdom that you don't get by just a casual observing. You know, looking at somebody, oh, she's cute, oh, he's fine. But they can be crazy. And just because you've been with each other for two weeks. See, that relapse may not happen, but every six months. You got to see, it takes time to see a pattern emerging. There's some people that can pay their bills on time. The first month, they're they good. The second month, they're good. Third month, they're good. But you, about eight months in, and you know, you, uh, what had happened was... And now you're starting to see a pattern emerge. You can't even see it in the first quarter. It takes a little time to see the crazy emerge. That's why God is, is trying to teach us to say, do this according to the pattern. This is tested and tried. Go according to the pattern. Trust the pattern. Not that words, trust the, the pattern. You don't know who people are just by observing them in a moment. You got to understand that some people are one way while it's cold and they're another way when it's hot. There are some uh, well, the people are one way when they have, they got a full belly and they're another way when they are hangry. You got to look at the patterns to really see the person. You don't know who people are by a moment. You can't judge them by an event. You have to give it enough time to see the pattern emerge. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you wish that I had taught this 25 years ago? <laughs> Learn to look for the patterns because the patterns will show you the person. The patterns will show you the person. It's interesting to note that the word identity, it literally means sameness of, biz, of, 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 uh, of, of being. Here's the Oxford Dictionary. It defines identity as the sameness of a person or thing at all times or in all circumstances. Sameness. That's, that's how a person gets an identity. An identity. The sameness of a person or thing at all times or in all circumstances. But it's, it's essentially the sameness of being. And that's how you get identity. That's how you get identity. And so in the context of this, this verse where we're looking at in Exodus 25, 40, a pattern is sort of an original or a model for proposed imitation or duplication. It is an archetype uh, for which copies are to be made. He says, make this according to the pattern that I showed you. Uh, it's, those of you that know in, in sewing notions and, and uh, tailoring work that they make a pattern for a dress or a pattern for a suit. And if you got the pattern, you can make it in any size that you need it as long as you have the, the pattern. You have the pattern. You make it according to the, to the pattern. And my question to you is what's the pattern for the life mission God has assigned to your life? What's the pattern for the life mission God has assigned to your life. We are to be followers of Christ as dear children. The word followers there in the, in the, in the New Testament, in the Greek, it is the word imitators. You are to be imitators of, of, of me as, as dear children. The Apostle Paul writing to the, to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as as I am of Christ. King James Version said be followers, but it, it actually is the word imitators. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now here's the, here's the caveat here. Don't just imitate people when they start deviating from Christ. 
Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, which means if I stop following Christ, you stop following me. That's, that's, how, you, that's how cults are created. Because they start off on track, saying and doing the right things, winning the confidence of the people, and then they take them to a way that is not of Christ at all. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate the, 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 the behavior and the beliefs that he laid out for me. But I think that the clearest way that we see God's example of pattern in our world is, is, is through a seed. Because seeds reproduce after their own kind. If you plant orange seeds, you're going to get oranges. If you plant apple seeds, you're going to get and it's not, you're not going to be surprised by planting an apple seed. God's not going to surprise you with a cucumber. <laughs> Seeds reproduce after their own kind. They reproduce after their own kind. They reproduce after their own kind. So one of the greatest seeds uh, that we carry, I think, is the seed of an idea. It's just the seed of an idea. Listen, just one idea from God can change your life forever. Just one, just one idea. That's all you need is one God idea. Just, you don't need 10. You need one God idea. If you can get one God idea, just one idea from God. What has God shown you that you can essentially create one time and then multiply many times? That's, that's that God idea. You write a book one time, you sell it thousands of times, millions of times. You create uh, the script for a movie one time, and you, it, the movie is seen thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times. You compose a song one time, and it's played millions of times. You produce a formula one time, and you sell that formula many times. When they, when they got the formula for Coca-Cola, can you imagine how many times... That thing has been bottled and reproduced just from one formula. And you know, back in the day, you couldn't go to a soda machine and get a Coke. You could only get it at a fountain. And a traveling salesman stopped by one day and gave them two words of advice. Just an idea that multiplied them. He said this, bottle it. They had never thought of it. They had the syrup and then they had the carbonated water and they would mix it and you could only get a Coke at a, at a soda fountain. And a salesman said, bottle it, bottle it. Those two words were the seed of an idea that empowered multiplication. What is the one idea that God may show you on the mountain in the realm of the spirit that can really transform your life? What is it? And he's shown you in the mountain of the spirit that you need to reproduce. What? What? Ask yourself that question. Ask yourself that question. May I remind you of this, of God's plan for us? The reason that he has to show us something in the mountain is because God has a plan for you. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God says, I got a future for you. I've got a blessed hope for you. No matter what you're going through, God says, I'm putting hope in you to pull you through the difficulty of the challenging of the discouragement that you're facing right now. God has a plan for you that is far better than yours. How do I know that? Because of Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Notice here what he says. He said, because my, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And just remember that whenever God requires obedience, nothing else, no other sacrifice will appease him. When we respectfully obey God, we demonstrate to God that we believe him, that we trust him. And one of God's greatest desires is to be believed. Sometimes I think that God gives us what I would call the illusion of choice because it ultimately guides the situation of our lives. He gives us the illusion of choice. I remember when our children were babies and, you know, at certain stages, they start wanting to assert their own individuality and making their own choices. So I would give my children the illusion of choice. 
And by that, I mean, you know, we would just like be getting ready for, for church. We would lay out for them two different outfits that we had approved of both of them. <laughs> See, you, you know, you create the list of what's on the approved reading. To choose from them, and they thought that they were choosing. And so one said, well, I want to wear the blue dress, and other one, I want to wear the red dress. And they thought that they were choosing, and they didn't know we had already chosen. <laughs> they were choosing among the chosen. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, I love this verse. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. I'm just telling you, you can make your own plans, but God has the right to trump whatever it is that you had put on paper, however you thought that it was going to go and what you thought was going to be a priority. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. But I'm telling you, the steps of a Lord, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. They lead you to a good place. They lead you to a good space. They bring you into purpose. They shift your, your anointing in your life because God blesses you because you're just walking and taking those steps of destiny. Please remember that even when you think that people are in control, I don't care whether it's Putin or Biden or the man over in North Korea. The Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of God and he turns it whichever way he wants to. I don't know whether you've ever noticed that. It's Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. The Lord controls rulers just as he determines the course of rivers. The Lord controls rulers. They are still under the rule of God. They can only go so far. They're on a leash. And see, a leash can give you the impression that you're big and bad and making your own decisions. God created Satan. Satan is on a leash. He only lets him go so far. He says, listen, you can, you can, you can take Job's stuff. You can afflict his body with sickness, but don't, don't. See, God put limits on you. You're on a leash, Satan. You can only go so far. You can only take them down so far. You can only mess with their, their marriage for so long. You can only do this. You're on a leash. Because God controls the rulers. God controls it. And let me just tell you this. Let me give you this scripture because there are some people that misunderstood the faith message and they think that you can name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. <laughs> you can't make God. I mean, he's God. We are not. He is God. We are not. We, we need him. First John chapter 5 verse 14 and 15. I believe in teaching with balance. Now, this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, not our own crazy desires. He hears us. See, there's a the caveat. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. And that is if we ask it according to his will. See, you have to see something. You have to see something. See it. And then you have to feel it. See it and then feel it. Let me tell you something. When you see something that God has in store for you, it gives you a feeling. It gives you a feeling. You have to see it. After you see it, you must feel. You must feel it. I, I, I remember when uh, uh, my wife and I, we were uh, redecorating the house and uh, we had an interior designer to come in and uh, she would show things to my wife and I. And then she turned to my wife and she said, does this give you the warm and fuzzies? <laughs> she'd ask her, just, she'd throw it and she said, does this give you the warm and fuzzies? Because if you, if you create something that's supposed to be beautiful, but if you're not feeling it, it doesn't matter how expensive it is and where it is imported from. If it doesn't give you the warm and fuzzies, if you see it and you don't feel it, let it pass. You know, I ought to create a dating app and maybe let's, you know. <laughs> if you see it and you don't feel it, you know, have you ever met people that look good but you're not feeling them? You got to see it and, and, and then feel it. I, I, listen, this is a prophetic word of the Lord. You got to see it and then feel it. I, I'm not talking about being led by your emotions, but listen, if you see something from God, 
It's got to feel right before you launch into it. And if it doesn't feel right, don't you be about it. If you see it, but it doesn't feel right, just hold your hope. Hold your hope. If you see it, but you don't feel it, if, if it doesn't feel right, there have been times that I knew that something was of God, but it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. I was invited to Indonesia to minister, and it didn't feel right. I, I got a seed in me. I, I knew that I could go there and minister, but it didn't feel right. The timing didn't feel right. And the month that I was scheduled to be there, they beheaded three Christian pastors. See, it didn't feel right to me. It didn't, it didn't feel right. I, I saw it, but it didn't feel right. I had the invitation, but it didn't feel right. And so I said, excuse me, but it, this doesn't feel right. I said, I can't come right now. It doesn't feel right. I saw it. I knew that it was of God, but it didn't feel right. You got to see it and then feel it. You got to see it and feel it. Listen, I don't want a musician to play that doesn't feel that music. I like to, you know, I'd like to see jazz musicians just get it because they look like they feel it. You know, they'd be all, I don't care whether they're playing a horn. I just, you know, when they, they be, I like when they make faces and I want, to, I want them to look like they feel the music so I can feel it. If you write, I want you to feel it. I want you to be crying while you are writing the words. I, I want you to be laughing if you're writing something funny. I want, if you don't feel it, why should I? I don't want to listen to a speaker that doesn't feel what they are saying. I don't know whether you can tell it or not, but I feel it like Jeremiah, like a fire shut up in my, my bones. I want a painter to feel it. I want a dancer to feel the choreography. I want you to feel whatever. I want a teacher to feel the passion with which they teach. You got to see it and then you got to feel it. You got to see it and then feel it. You got to see it and feel it. See it and feel it. And let me tell you this. Don't let pain stop you. Feel it and keep moving. Don't let pain stop you. Feel it and keep moving because there are some days you're going to be hurting. It's not going to be easy. But you got to feel the pain and keep moving. There are times that mama doesn't feel like getting out. But she's got somebody depending on her. she got to go not because she feels like it. You can't let pain stop you. I love something that this wonderful woman of God, Corey Ten Boom, said. She said, the enemy always wants us to believe that we need to stop hurting before we can move. What a lie. We must move forward even if it is painful. There are some people that never are able to transition out of certain things in life because it's painful. And you don't want to hurt somebody's feeling. Sometimes to do what is right hurts you. It is painful, but it's the right thing to do. Don't let pain keep you from making a right decision. It's painful, but you got to do it. How do you feel about what God has shown you about your life? How do you feel about what he has shown you about your future? How do you feel about what he has shown you about your destiny? I'm so glad that we have a Savior who identified with our feelings. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 and 16, notice. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And then it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus can identify with you because he was tempted. And he went through hunger. And he went through tiredness. He felt it. Here's the principle. If you can't feel it, you can't heal it. If you can't feel it, you cannot heal it. You have to be able to identify with people's pain. And sometimes... God will send pain into your life to make you a more compassionate person. You think that they're faking. You think that, hey, just suck it up and just move on. Some days it is paralyzing. And it's difficult. It's a challenge. And it takes everything, every fiber of your being to say, I'm not going to sit here and let it stop me. I'm going to keep moving even though I'm hurting and even though I'm lacking energy. But I got to keep going. Somebody's depending on me. 
There's something, if you see it, it's what you see that empowers you to move even when you don't feel like moving. But Jesus is concerned about how you feel. If he ever asks you how you're doing, it's not just a cursory greeting. He truly is interested and he identifies with the pain that we feel. And I want you to understand that whenever you are passionate, whatever you're passionate about will pain you because passion means pain. Whatever you are passionate about will pain you because passion means pain. If you're passionate about your children, they'll pain you. If you're passionate about a spouse, it'll pain you. If you're passionate about your job, it will pain you. Whatever you're passionate about will, pro uh, will produce pain in you. But you know Jesus cares about that? He was passionate about us, and he suffered. You hurt, you got to see it, and you got to feel it. You got to see it, and you got to feel it. It's got to feel right. You see it, and it feels right. If you see something, but it doesn't feel right, don't fool with it. God works even with our emotions, our feelings. I love Maya Angelou's statement that she said, I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. People will never forget how you made them feel. You make a person feel disrespected, they'll never forget it. But if you make a person in a conversation feel like they were the only one there in a whole crowd, they'll never forget how you made them feel. They'll never forget. People don't forget how you make them feel. See it, feel it. See what God has in store for you. Move with that feeling when it feels right. And then trust God that it will work in your favor. Trust. See, feel, trust. You see something in the spirit. You got to feel that the timing is right. You got to feel that I'm ready now. You got to feel that God is with me and that he's given me a promise before you now trust to launch out and to go for it. Remember Romans 8, 28, and we know, not we hope, not maybe so, and we know that all things, not some things, all things work together for the good of them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. I want you to notice Abraham's incredible faith and trust in God. After he saw something, God says, Abraham, get up and go to a land that I will show you. I'm going to let you see something. You're going to feel a certain way about it, and that feeling is going to empower you to get up and leave the place of familiarity and go into a place where you got to trust me, where you have no experience, and where you don't know any other people. You got to trust me because you're getting ready to... You're getting ready to transition. This is a prophetic word. Some of you are in, in transition places in your life right now. You've never been there before. You don't know what it holds for you, but you see it and you feel that I've got to go. Something has got to give. Something has got to change. And I got to bust a move. God, I, I, I'm going, I'm, I'm trusting and trembling. Trusting and trembling. Romans chapter 4 verse 18. Against all hope. All against hope. Not with hope. Against hope. When it seemed crazy, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him so shall your offering offspring be and without weakening in his faith without weakening in his faith he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead it's not what it looks like don't go by what it looks like yet he never did waver he never did waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God. It was in his giving glory to God that actually strengthens his faith. Giving glory to God strengthens your faith. Even when you're suffering, even when you're hurting, even when it feels like you're dying, giving glory to God strengthens your faith. But notice this verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Fully persuaded. Trust in him. Trust in him. Trust in him. I encourage you today. See where God wants to take you. See. See where God wants to take you. Feel the power of what he showed you. Because when God begins to show you something, an excitement rises on the inside of you. 
That's what prophecy does. It, it gives you a picture of where God has taken you. And we get excited. We start feeling it. And when you feel that the timing is right now, God will say, do it now. Go now. Move. And then you trust. You trust him by taking a leap in the direction of whatever it is that God has shown you. You see it. You feel that the timing is right. And you trust. Take the leap of faith. And for many of you, it's going to be like when we were kids and we played double dutch. You remember when they'd be turning these two ropes? And what you, you had to see it, you have to stand there and watch it for a while to get the, the rhythm of the pattern. See, a pattern is predictable. And if they all of a sudden sped it up and change the pattern and start taking it back another way in different tempos it would trip us up but we have to see it get the pattern so that we pace ourselves and we know exactly when to jump in you have to see it and then you have to start rocking with it so that you feel it and when you then feel that the time is right because there are people that have different levels of comfort as to when they jump in. But you've got to catch the rhythm, see it, and then catch the rhythm of the pattern, of the turning. And then you take the leap. And it's a mess if you just watch it, see it, and catch the rhythm. But you're scared to ever jump in. And start making it do what it do. Take your time and take the leap. Some people see targets and they talk about stuff. And they're ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim. And they never pull the trigger. Because it takes trust. That I trust my instinct here. I trust what I feel. Sometimes you can't even explain it. But I just feel that this is right. When God has shown you something. And you know that this is not from me. This is of him. Trust the feeling. Feel it. Trust it. And jump in and make it do what it do. I hope that you can see what I'm saying. Feel it. And that you'll trust God and make the leap of faith for your life. I hope you got something out of the word of the Lord today. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for every person who's here and every person who's watching that as you show them things as they get into the spirit, your spirit, the true spirit of the living God substantiated by the power of the blood of Jesus that you will show us things to come. We trust you. Thank you for giving dreams and visions to men and women. God, thank you for allowing us to be able to feel the confirmation of your word today. Thank you, Father, for confirming when it's time for us to take the leap, when it's time for us to pull the trigger on an idea. We'll feel that it's right. And God, though we don't have all of the answers and all of the components and understand the timings of all of it, it is then, God, that after we see it and feel it, that we trust you. That when we jump out of the nest, that you will empower our wings or you'll catch us. Lord, we look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith, that whatever you have started in us, you intend to finish. And Jesus, we trust you today with our whole heart. God, I pray that you will open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. As you take us into the realms of the Spirit, Lord, may we see things that we've never seen before. God, we implore you for your perspective. Thank you that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not to make us feel important, but to give us divine perspective. Thank you for your perspective today, dear Lord Jesus. 
that as we see it and feel it down in our soul, in our gut, that this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And that though we don't understand all of the elements, God, that it empowers us to be able to trust you. And today, God, we declare that we trust you with our very lives. We give ourselves to you. And in every shadowy thing, the scary things that lurk in the shadows that we don't understand, God, may our trust emerge to brand new levels. When doubt fills our minds, God, may we trust you and keep moving though we trust. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, let your will be done in the lives of your people. Open the eyes of their understanding, God. May they see in the realm of the Spirit, see just a glimpse of the things that you've prepared for us. And may it cause us to feel excited toward our future, our family, our finances, our friends. And God, may we go trusting and trembling, walking with you, yet confident in the very one who has promised. Thank you, Father, that in every endeavor that you allow us to be able to see the end from the beginning, that you let us feel that the timing is right, that this is right, that this is the Lord's doing, that you are leading us, guiding us, ordering our steps. We declare today in the name of Jesus that Lord, where you guide, there you provide. Where you lead, there you feed. And God, that your will is your bill. And we trust you to be able to handle it all. Our lives are in your hand. God, we trust you with all that we are, with all that we hope to be. We trust you. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen, amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.